Welcome to the final session of our meeting. Um, before we get started with our speakers, we'd like to announce our Young Investigator Award Ceremony. So this is a um, award that's given to an outstanding abstract presentation from one of the Young Investigators. The award comes with a $500 travel stipend for next year's meeting and free registration. Um, we are hoping, although obviously we don't know yet, that our meeting next year can actually be live. Um, and in person and that the travel stipend can go towards travel towards a actual location, not just travel around your living room. But um, we'd like to announce this year's winner who is, da -da -da -da, Dr. Brianna Oliveira Mui. And we thank you for outstanding abstract presentation at this year's meeting, as well as for your active presentation in many of the chat rooms and uh, other discussions. So congratulations to uh, Dr. Oliveira Mui. And with that, I believe we'll move into our first presentation, which is um, some experiences by myself, and then um, we'll introduce each of the subsequent speakers as we go. Good morning, my name is Christine Erlinson. I'm an associate professor at the University of Colorado and an infectious disease trained physician. And we'd like to end this year's meeting with an interactive presentation and discussion. We've talked about many complex issues around the care of older with HIV throughout the meeting, but we still don't have a great sense of how to actually integrate all of these concepts into clinical practice. As care for older adults with HIV has become more and more complicated, there has been an attempt in many settings to integrate geriatric and HIV care, but can this be a universal approach? Is it site specific? And what elements do or do not work? There are currently several models investigating the integration of HIV and geriatric care, as you can see on this table. Today, we're gonna to hear from Drs. Bofito, Green, Schmalzi, and Siegler about some of their positive experiences, as well as their struggles in starting successful programs. However, I'd like to start this talk with some approaches that have been less successful so that we can learn from both experiences. We started a program at the University of Colorado primarily to address the complaint that patients needed a geriatrician and couldn't necessarily be referred to the geriatrician because they limit new patients to a certain age. We found a geriatrician that was willing to see patients with HIV regardless of age, and she facilitated a referral to our seniors clinic. Our seniors clinic was located in the same building, but a different floor as our HIV clinic. Unfortunately, she wasn't able to see patients actually in the ID clinic due to billing. We advertised this service throughout the clinic and the pharmacy. We sent recruitment emails to all of our providers several times. Our pharmacists and students actually reached out directly to about 200 patients that were 50 or older to let them know about the program, particularly targeting those that had multiple medications um, and polypharmacy. Over the course of about 18 months, we had relatively few referrals and many more no-shows. In fact, we only had about 11 patients that completed at least one seniors clinic visit over that time period. We did uh, identify a lot of geriatric conditions. As you can see in the table, we had about um, uh, half of our patients that had falls, hearing loss, or urinary incontinence. The majority had vision loss, and a few uh, were identified as newly cognitive and cognitively impaired. The average number of medications was quite high with almost 18 medications per patient. Many of those were high risk medications and our pharmacists work, working with us helped to recommend stopping many of these medications with fairly limited success. Many other topics were addressed, including screenings for osteoporosis and cognition, uh, patients advanced directives were filled out and driving safety was often assessed. Some of our recommendations weren't completed, and this was oftentimes because the patient felt overwhelmed, didn't want to go to see multiple different providers, never scheduled some of their uh, follow-up assessments, or really did not have a desire to stop the high-risk medications the pharmacist had recommended. So some things certainly went well. And, um, those included um, that older patient, or the providers with these complicated older patients really appreciated the input. We had a geriatrician who was very willing and interested to see patients with HIV. New medical issues such as cognitive impairment, urinary incontinence were identified and able to be remedied in some of the patients. Additional screenings were accomplished, advanced directives were addressed. Some very complicated patients actually continued their care in the geriatric clinic. And this was a very simple program. We didn't require any additional funding or grant support, it, grant support to keep things functioning. 
However, we also had a lot of barriers to success. We had fairly little uptake from our providers and patients. I think a lot of the providers didn't necessarily appreciate the added benefit of a geriatric um, consultation in that geriatric perspective. And our patients oftentimes didn't actually see themselves as old and see the need to go to a senior's clinic. The fact that we were unable to have a geriatrician in the HIV clinic, I think was one of the major barriers. Providers often forgot when they didn't see the geriatrician sitting in the provider room or when that geriatrician wasn't able to give them direct feedback in the clinic. Patients also didn't want to go um, reschedule or go into a new clinic. The lack of additional support in our program, we had our um, social workers through our clinic, but they weren't necessarily coordinating care with the geriatric recommendations and helping to walk patients through the process, um, obtaining additional consultation for nutrition, helping with advanced directives and home care, and having that coordination of care, I think was a major um, barrier to some of the success. Um, in collaboration with a stellar medical student, we actually reached out and talked to many of the existing programs and found that a lot of our experiences were quite similar to others uh, that uh, had a lot of barriers without having that geriatrician embedded within the HIV clinic. So keeping in mind some of these aspects that didn't work, let's now hear from some of our colleagues that have established successful programs. In the panel discussion, we'd love to hear from others who have incorporated or attempted to incorporate geriatric and HIV care. What has worked? What hasn't? Is it improving care? And what are some of the next best steps forward? I'd next like to introduce Dr. Marta Bofita. She is a consultant physician and the clinical research lead of the clinical research facility, HIV service lead at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, and works at the Imperial College London, where she runs numerous research projects and clinical trials, consults on complex pharmacologic issues, and sees patients with HIV, where she founded the first HIV over 50 years clinic in London. She teaches HIV medicine and pharmacology, She's trained in Italy, the US, and the UK, and has an interest in antiretroviral drug pharmacology. Uh, she also contributes to the educational, scientific, and guidelines formations of national bodies, including the British HIV Association. We're happy to have her here today to share some of her experiences from her program. Dr. Bufito? Hi, my name is Martha Bufito, and I'm talking about the HIV Over 50 uh, clinic that we run in London, in the United Kingdom. So as you are well aware, comorbidities are prevalent among aging people living with HIV. And uh, studies have shown that people living with HIV are at a higher risk of certain comorbidities compared to people without HIV. And that is especially true when people age and get older. And this was a study uh, that, uh, uh, a cohort study that showed uh, that quite, uh, quite uh, clearly. Importantly, the high number of comorbidities that may affect people living with HIV who are aging leads to the use of polypharmacy. Polypharmacy, in fact, is particularly prevalent in older people living with HIV. Polypharmacy means being on five or more drugs. Important polypharmacy means being on 10 or more drugs. And the reason why this is important is because when someone is on polypharmacy, is a, at a higher risk of drug toxicity and drug-drug interaction. This slide shows a long list of studies that have reported high prevalence of polypharmacy in people aging with HIV in different countries in Europe, in the world. So in terms of polypharmacy and risk for drug-drug interactions in people aging with HIV, uh, not too long ago, we published a, a, a sub-analysis of the POPI study, which is a cohort study uh, looking at health outcomes in people aging with HIV, in people uh, younger than 50 with HIV, and people uh, aging without HIV. Uh, we uh, saw uh, that um, People with HIV who are aging are uh, at a higher risk for, again, polypharmacy and drug-drug interactions 
And this is also true when we take away, when we exclude the antiretrovirals from the drug combination. So the higher risk of drug-drug interactions occurs also uh, between the different communications. And this is quite important because it's something that we have to watch in the clinical practice. So what do we do in our over 50 clinic? In 2009, we started to run this clinic dedicated to people above the age of 50 living with HIV. And we started to offer, first of all, more time where we could discuss particular health matters, health concerns, and um, we would offer a few extra tests. So, because what we discussed about polypharmacy and drug-drug interactions, we do review communications very carefully in the over 50 clinics. Anything that is prescribed from, by us, so obviously HIV medications, and the potential of the antiretrovirals that is prescribed to be uh, interactive drug, to cause drug-drug interactions. We look at anything else that is prescribed uh, over-the-counter medication, herbal, recreational drugs, and amount of hard codes. And again, we review drug-drug interactions very carefully. So we recently published um, some data from our over-50 clinic looking at the anticholinergic risk, which is something that is looked at in aging people without HIV, but it wasn't really um, ever discussed in people living with HIV. And obviously, the increasing anticholinergic drug exposure increased the risk of side effects. And also, using boosters like ritonavir may increase the exposure of certain anticholinergic drugs, leading to an increase of the anticholinergic risk. So this is something that is worth reviewing carefully in people aging with HIV. We also offer extra blood tests. We look at testosterone, total testosterone, free testosterone, and when these are low, we spend more time looking at uh, cardiovascular disease, osteoporosis, fatigue, mental health. Um, we link our over 50 clinic to many other specialist clinics. So we have, a, for example, uh, a menopause clinic for women aging with HIV. So we send them from the over 50 clinic to the, meto, uh, to the menopause clinic. And also in terms of trans and binary and other genders, we uh, discuss uh, symptomatology, drug interactions, and we refer them if uh, there's a need for that. We test for PSA, we make sure that people have uh, an anal smear when possible, and we ensure that the mammography is done. People living with HIV sometimes are quite attached to HIV care providers and may not attend um, primary care or other specialties, so this is all discussed in the over 50 clinic. Also, in view of the fact that uh, people living with HIV seems to be diagnosed with cancer at an earlier age than people without HIV, and this has been shown to be true for visceral cancers. We focus um, on cardiovascular risk, and we do measure uh, cardiovascular risk with equations like QRIS2 or QRIS3 or Framingham, and we do request a coronary artery calcification score. We do work on reducing traditional cardiovascular disease risk factors. These have been shown to actually be really important, not only in people without HIV, but also in people with HIV. So reducing blood pressure, reducing cholesterol, smoking cessations are discussions that we have an intervention that we like to promote very much. Also, we do promote lifestyle, healthy lifestyle, uh, healthy diet, exercise, and we link the over 50 clinic to our metabolic clinic, to our physiotherapists and dietitians, and we like to prescribe exercise and make sure that people understand the importance of healthy lifestyles to decrease cardiovascular risk. In terms of coronary artery calcification score, when this is high, we do take it into consideration remarkably. We recently published the analysis of the relationship between 
the conventional risk pools and coronary artery calcification scores in people living with HIV. And we show that some people might benefit from a statin because they have a high coronary artery calcification score, but they do have a low um, Q risk to uh, result or vice versa. So it is a, an additional tool uh, to uh, analyze the heart health of people that we found very useful in aging people with HIV. And we have a specialist HIV cardiology clinic that we refer people with high results, with high CACs, uh, that again are reviewed by the cardiologist. Importantly, we look at bones. We uh, request bone mineral density scans. We measure frac scores and vitamin D. Data in the literature show that people living with HIV are at an increased risk of low bone mineral density and fractures. This is true both for males and females. It can be affected by past HIV treatment and it's increasing with age. We follow the EAX guidelines in terms of when to request a BMD, a bone mineral density. So we do request it in postmenopausal women and men above the age of 50. And again, we measure the FRAC score to understand whether people need the treatment based on the results of the bone scan. We have a frailty clinic, a care of the elderly clinic that is run by the general medicine consultant and the HIV consultant. And in the care of the elderly HIV clinic, we also assess frailty and management of frailty and other comorbidities, including osteoporosis. Finally, we look at how people are from a mental health point of view and a social situation point of view. Isolation can be an important concern in people aging with HIV, has been an important concern over the COVID-19 pandemic. So we ask people about their social situation. We ask them if they're concerned about their memory, concentrations, cognitions, and whether anybody else has expressed any concern about their memory, concentration, and cognition. If the answer is yes, we give them questionnaires, a depression questionnaires, and an anxiety questionnaire, and an everyday memory questionnaire to see whether we need to further refer to psychology, to neuropsychometric testing, or to the HIV and neurology clinic. So in conclusion, this was our experience of an over 50 clinic that is dedicated to people living with HIV in London. And as you can see, it's a bit of a, an extra screening for people who are aging with HIV. And it allows us to refer to certain key specialist clinics that people may need because of comorbidities and HIV. We also undergo some regular audit service evaluations, patients' feedbacks and publications, as you've seen in the presentations. The next step is to make sure that all staff is actually trained and is able to run the model of the clinic, in general, HIV clinic, when they see people over the age of 50, so that referrals to the specialist clinics come from all physicians, all care providers that, again, deliver HIV care. And this will help us again, especially in uh, difficult times, like during the COVID pandemic, where the way we run clinic has changed remarkably. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Burpito, for that fantastic uh, overview of your clinic. I'd like to next introduce Dr. Meredith Green. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine in the Division of Geriatrics at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Green is a geriatrician and Academy, American Academy of HIV Medicine specialist who's particularly interested in improving care for an increasing number of older adults living with HIV. Um, she's interested in how geriatric assessments can be incorporated into HIV clinical care. Um, and is, uh, as part of that, the Associate Direct, uh, Director of the Golden Compass or HIV Aging Program at San Francisco General Hospital, where she provides weekly geriatric consultations for patients living with HIV. And she'll share her experiences with that clinic with us today. Dr. Green? 
thank you for that introduction and I'm excited to speak with you today. These are my disclosures. And so just to orient you to what I'm going to be talking about for the next few minutes, I was reflecting on it was three years ago, 2017, when I first spoke about the development of our new program, Golden Compass at Ward 86. And I'm just going to briefly talk about an overview and the development of the program, but then spend time talking about our initial evaluation using an implementation science framework, REAIM, and then talk about what we're doing currently, planning for the future, and how we've adapted the last several months during the COVID-19 pandemic. So the Golden Compass program came out of several things, but the most important being our process of stakeholder engagement, where we did surveys and focus groups with patients and providers at the clinic. And in fact, that's where the name of the program, Golden Compass, came from, this idea of navigation and the complexity of navigating the healthcare system, and that the term golden years was the acceptable term for aging across all of the focus groups we did. And then drawing on this idea of a compass and navigation, we used what resources we had locally to then focus services around points of the compass. They don't all exactly align, but as an overview, heart and mind, we have, we're lucky to have Dr. Priscilla Shu, an HIV cardiologist who now comes once a month to the clinic for her own cardiology clinic, done brain health classes, cognitive assessments and geriatrics clinic, in the Eastern Point focusing on bones and strength, fall assessments, functional assessments, and a weekly chair exercise class. The Western Point connecting people to make sure they have age appropriate screenings and helping them um, connect to services. And then this other point, network and navigation, addressing social isolation and loneliness, and really working to strengthen our partnerships with community organizations. So sometimes it's also helpful to hear a story of how a person might go through our program. So this is one example. This is a 62-year-old who identifies as a Latino male. He also identifies as an HIV long-term survivor. And when I saw him in clinic, one of the things that stood out was he was reporting dizziness. We noticed his blood pressure medications had just been changed, and he was also on medicines for an enlarged prostate. And we checked his blood pressure, and he, it dramatically dropped from laying to standing. So we adjusted his medications, and his dizziness improved. At the time, he was also feeling more isolated because he had lost a family member. So in addition to connecting him to a therapist, we connected him with one of our community partners who paired him with a volunteer who was still meeting weekly with him two years up until the COVID-19 pandemic. And then he really became highly engaged in all of the classes we were offering. And you can see when he was reflecting on his mental and physical health, you can see what he said about the program in the quote on this slide. So that's an overview of some of the services and how someone might interact with the program. So I'm going to present findings that were just published this year on the first year and a half, um, which involved both quantitative and qualitative methods using the REAIN implementation science framework to guide our evaluation, which stands for REACH, Effectiveness, Adoption, Implementation, and Maintenance. Because this was only the first year and a half, we didn't examine the maintenance phase. But in terms of REACH, which was at the patient level, we saw um, just over 200 participants who participated in one or more aspects of the program. And in interviews, it was interesting to hear from providers that they still sometimes had difficulty making a direct referral to see me, a geriatrician, um, with some of their patients, especially those in their 50s. And then in terms of effectiveness, we focused on early outcomes like satisfaction and acceptability of services. And we found that more than 90% of the patients and provider surveys were very satisfied with services. And in interviews, um, medication assessment, mobility, and cognitive evaluations were all viewed as very valuable. At the 
adoption, this was at the provider level, so more than 85% of providers referred at least one patient to the geriatrics clinic, and 60% of providers had referred at least one patient to the cardiology clinic. And then implementation is actually how faithful were you to what you set out to do? And if you think of that figure I showed earlier, um, we actually did predominantly what we set out to do. And in interviews, one of the themes that was notable was that the co-location of services was an important feature of the program. So what did we learn in this initial evaluation? I think the one thing that really stands out to me that was despite all our best intention to have a program name without HIV, without geriatrics, still addressing the stigma of ageism, um, because it was hard for providers to sometimes refer to see me without using aging or geriatrics. And I think also recognizing that there are stigmas with some of the assessments, like cognitive assessment that are done in clinic. And one of the suggestions was framing as helping you to stay healthy as you're living longer with HIV that we're now using. For those who are potentially considering starting a program or a clinic, I think the other thing is it just takes time to develop and implement. For example, our classes initially started out with only two or three participants and it took time for them to reach the full um, class size. And then in terms of outcome evaluation, we focused on early outcomes that I presented and you'll hear here at this conference from Vivian Chen who will present on some of our pres prescribing and, and polypharmacy work. Um, I think what I've learned is that qualitative methods can be really important, um, especially for consultative models. I think as a field, we need to think through what are the outcomes? Is it quality of life? And um, just thinking through sometimes if you're a consultative clinic, it can be hard to show a change in a quantitative survey of uh, quality of life. And then just things we can talk about in discussion, challenges for the field, um, who would benefit from consultation, the role of the consultant and ongoing funding. And then looking forward, so what did we learn? So we're working on expanding the reach of the program. I can share we've seen another um, approximately 200 additional people. Um, and to expand the reach for those who had trouble coming in, especially having an e-consult option so that providers can still ask a question even if the patient doesn't come in for the appointment. Our nurses, um, all of the nurses in the clinic were getting ready to expand screenings and were being trained on how to do a lot of the geriatric assessments. And then we are also working on expanding just general geriatrics and aging knowledge of providers and patients. Um, both, and we were doing this in partnership with our Optimizing Aging Collaborative, um, which is our geriatric workforce enhancement program that does training of providers and staff. And then, of course, this year we've all had to adapt how we deliver services. And when, when COVID-19 started in March, like most clinics, we switched to telehealth visits. Um, especially for specialty services initially, and then slowly have been increasing in-person capabilities. And just to point out that I do feel that many of the geriatric assessments can be done, especially on a video platform, and even can be adapted to phone, although sometimes I find that more challenging. Our classes also move to a virtual platform. And then our clinic was very proactive initially in doing outreach calls to older adults. And as shelter in place continued locally, we then began doing additional outreach calls to some of our older patients to address things like caregiving concerns and other issues that might be coming up as the pandemic continues. And I think one of the things that this brought up was the issue of the digital divide. So some of our patients, as we move things to virtual platform, for classes were not able to navigate connecting either through lack of internet or lack of a device. And the one thing I will say though is I think also thinking through how telehealth can improve access in some cases. We actually just did a focus group with some of our participants and for some, especially those who had to travel or for mobility limitations, they actually want the 
virtual platform to continue even when in-person classes resume because it, it made it much easier for them. And so if we had to take a really big picture view for those who are developing programs or clinics, the stakeholder engagement and knowing your local resources are the critical things in developing a program. For everyone, whether you're developing or evaluating programs, I think implementation science frameworks can really help guide that process. And then finally, as we're all adapting right now, I think there, it is important that telehealth can actually improve access and have an important role as long as we can bridge that digital divide. And I just want to thank everyone that we that have worked on this project and thank you for your time today. Thanks, Meredith, for that fantastic overview of your program, as well as some of your insights into how you've addressed these issues of care during the COVID pandemic. Um, we'll move next to Dr. Sarah Schmalzi, Schmalzel, Schmalz, sorry, Dr. S Dr. Schmalzi. Um, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Internal Medicine and the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of Maryland. She's an associate program director for the Infectious Disease Fellowship, as well as medical director for the Thrive Program program, which we'll hear about today. The Thrive program is a primary care and specialty clinic for approximately 2,500 people living with HIV that's located in Baltimore City. She sees outpatients for HIV care and prevention, hepatitis C, and general infectious diseases. Um, she also attends on the inpatient medicine and ID service and sees inpatient uh, ID consults. And she's co-PI of the STRONG program, which is embedded within the Thrive program. It's a grant-funded project designed to integrate geriatric ass assessments in her HIV primary care clinic. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here to share the STRONG model for geriatric care within Thrive, which is the HIV clinic of the Institute of Human Virology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. This is a grant-funded project through Gilead Sciences, so my team and I are all receiving a portion of our salaries through this funding. There are no other disclosures. In the next 10 minutes, I'll quickly describe who we are, the model of care that we've built and how. I'll go through a case example and I'll end with a rundown of what's working well and what challenges we've come across. Starting with who we are, what's Thrive and what's Strong. So the Thrive Clinic offers primary and specialty care to approximately 3,000 people living with HIV in Baltimore City. JOX is our outreach partner and our combined services are listed here. I won't read through the list, but if you scan the bullet points here, you'll gather that our aim is to provide the most comprehensive care possible to keep our patients in one center for everything that they need and to meet patients where they are by addressing their medical, social, and mental health needs. We're very fortunate to have extensive staff to meet those aims, including approximately 30 physicians, nurse practitioners, and infectious disease fellows, a strong social work program with a social worker for every patient, and assistance with housing, mental health, employment, and substance abuse for those that need it. We also have five pharmacists, a dietitian, and peer support coaches, and other staff as you see here. Moving on to the strong team, this is a multidisciplinary team constructed of Thrive team members and experts in gerontology, epidemiology, and education from other schools in the University of Maryland, all with an interest in HIV and aging. The first year of this project was actually fully devoted to developing a plan and developing the model. The goals were to obtain patient and clinic input regarding priorities for older adults with HIV, train staff in geriatric principles, and identify available resources that can benefit people aging with HIV. And then to take what we had learned from all of this to introduce the geriatric assessments into clinical care at Thrive for people over 50 with HIV and utilize that baseline data to determine geriatric needs and eventually assess the impact of the program. And finally, to disseminate the results in the model for an integrated geriatric HIV care model that could be adopted by other clinics. Gathering input included two patient listening sessions with some example questions seen here. Concurrently, we conducted provider input sessions to understand what gaps they saw in geriatric care at Thrive get their ideas to fill those gaps and also ask them to review our proposed model. Providers also did a pretest and a needs assessment on geriatric principles and our nursing and social work staff took a quiz on biases related to age. There was also a lecture series for social work on aging topics noted here. And as a group, we saw local, regional and national expertise and resources on HIV and aging. We became part of the Maryland Coalition on HIV and Aging and several of us were actually able to come to this conference last year for the first time which was really a wonderful opportunity to meet others in the field and further refine the model that we had been developing. And after all of that, we were able to decide what assessments we should be doing, what data we wanted to collect, and the logistics of all of that. So I will walk you through 
uh, an overview of the final model and then go into further details on each part. Any eligible patient um, can self-refer by calling a phone number. They'll be scheduled for their assessment visit and then they get a reminder call the day before. The in-person portion is done by one of our grad students and that takes about an hour. This includes validated assessments of mental health, cognition, physical function, and quality of life, plus our own questionnaire meant to address topics for which validated data collection instruments don't exist. Participants receive a $25 grocery store gift card and prior to leaving, they're offered follow-up appointments with their medical provider and a pharmacist to review those results. In the meantime, chart review is done by a medical provider and a pharmacist on the strong team. All of the information from the assessments, questionnaire, and chart reviews then goes to three places. It goes to their team, goes to medical records to be scanned into the chart and into a REDCap database. Needed interventions are determined for the team and they're at their discretion. We didn't mandate any particular intervention because we wanted to watch what happens when all of this information is handed off to the team so we could track what assessment results seem to have the biggest impact on care delivered. We do also have some money set aside for medical equipment that's not covered by insurance and we've used that for things like canes and grab bars um, and we also have a resource guide available to the team. Shown here is our summary result sheet for the in-person assessments. Um, you can see under the cognition and mental health domain, we tested for depression, suicidality, anxiety, and cognition. For example, for depression, we use the patient health questionnaire nine instrument, and there's a place here uh, for the patient's score to be reported. In physical functioning, we did the short physical performance battery, uh, and the Older Americans Resources and Services score for activities of daily living. We did the freed frailty assessment and a nutrition assessment. And finally, the PROMISE score was done to measure quality of life. Most of these are questionnaires, but there is a small amount of physical activity, including a three meter walk, a sit to stand exercise and grip strength testing, for example. The medical team would then receive all of this information with the abnormalities highlighted. And then we have um, this third column there to suggest possible next steps. For example, a high score on the depression or anxiety screen should be referred to social work and evidence of frailty or weakness could warrant referral to physical therapy. The strong questionnaire was specifically created by our team to get at some of the major social and miscellaneous aspects of living with HIV that gerontological assessments might miss. This was largely based on input from Thrive, the strong team, and from those patient listening sessions, and this takes about 30 minutes to complete. This is the medical chart review. Major categories we look at are HIV, bone mineral density, cardiovascular risk, renal and liver disease, and cancer screenings. These were specifically selected to look at age-related comorbidities in people aging with HIV. For each section, we're recording the result, noting if the screen is up to date and when it is due next. Most of this is fairly straightforward. It's the cardiovascular risk, risk section that's a little bit more complex to complete. This is all based on what has to be input into the ASCVD risk calculator, which is why the categories look oversimplified like race as black or white and sex as male or female. Um, but here we record the smoking status, whether that patient has hypertension, diabetes, or abnormal lipids, and if they're taking an aspirin or statin. Based on the calculated ASCVD score, we then include whether the current guidelines recommend that the patient should be on an aspirin or statin and would make note if there are any recommended changes. The pharmacy chart review is similar. They're looking primarily at medication reconciliation, including whether the list in the electronic medical record is up to date, how many prescribers, how many pharmacies, and how many medications there are, and if there are any dangerous medications or drug interactions, and they'll also take a look to see if there's evidence of non-adherence. The pharmacist would then fix those issues themselves as they go and notify the HIV specialist if there are any further changes needed. They'll often set up an appointment with the patient to review this and to educate the patient as needed as well. Um, and this is just one example of what the final summary might look like once complete. So in red, the scores are written and are circled, and the highlighted areas are abnormal scores that we want to draw the team's attention to. For example, this patient had a high depression score, a low cognition score, difficulty with grooming, was considered to be pre-frail and at moderate nutritional risk, and had a low quality of life score. Based on this, each of these areas could be further discussed with the patient, and a plan could be made to address each. Uh, I'm not including the chart review case examples in the interest of time, but it would essentially be very, uh, very similar to this portion. And this is a very consolidated summary of key points in one patient's social questionnaire. The patient was very close with our social work director, Robin, and had been working with her for over a decade. So much of the information on the form was already known, but there were also some surprises too. For example, this patient had never mentioned any housing concerns or sought help in this area and had not been in a relationship to our knowledge for many, many years. However, in seeking assistance in housing through this questionnaire, a larger conversation opened up. 
she wasn't actually sharing the housing with a cousin as she had written. It was a male partner and she disclosed that this was not a healthy relationship and that's actually why she wanted help with housing to find um, other options to leave this person. So I'll end with some remarks on what seems to be going well with our model plus some challenges. The first key factor in our success thus far is that the entire clinic really got this project. They saw that it was filling a major unaddressed need for our patients and thus well, it's been very well received. Uh, the patients that did the listening session also really enjoyed that and actually requested that continue, which we thought was a wonderful outcome and could help address some of the so social isolation issues noted in those same sessions. The participants that did the study, though this was a self-selected group that was earning $25, they did also tell our grad students that they felt this was worthwhile and they were happy to be able to have these assessments done. As I alluded to when I talked about the questionnaire, we found out a lot of stuff about our patients that we never would have had the time to ask about. I think the partial anonymity of filling out these forms with a grad student they had never met before really helped people open up. Um, our grad students also remarked how much the patients really enjoyed talking and sharing their stories. So I think that alone was therapeutic for some people. Uh, of course, getting data is incredibly helpful as a clinic to better understand who our patients are, what their needs are, and to identify areas we should maybe be applying for additional funding to address. And I also suspect this will lead to various QI projects to try to improve areas that we find gaps. This project has also improved general awareness of geriatric assessment and resources. Um, and we believe that there's great potential here to improve patient care. From a business standpoint, which is uh, listed last for a reason, patients doing these assessments could also have multiple visits to do the assessments to receive the results and to get further tests or care that they need. In terms of challenges, there are a few and they're actually, I think, very important. Um, there were some logistical considerations which really took us a while to figure out and obviously would be unique to each clinic attempting to do this. One struggle, of course, is that if we identify a problem, we'd like to fix it and some things are not fixable medically or within our resource constraints. So we struggle, for example, when patients have a low MOCA score for cognition and there's no reversible medical reason is there are not really a lot of resources to successfully address cognitive decline, especially in a patient population with a lot of other social and financial challenges. Uh, the biggest challenge, obviously, is the question of whether or not this is sustainable when our grant ends. We currently have two half-time grad students to do the assessments, and the patients, in part, may be motivated to take part because of the monetary incentive. What happens when both of these disappear, I don't know. We've also found that it takes a really long time to fully review the results of these assessments with patients. This is difficult to do in a brief medical visit, so it might require additional visits or longer visits, and there's always a question of how that level of care fits into the U.S. healthcare system model. Part of our hope with the project is that the Thrive staff and providers will see the benefits of these assessments and eventually take it upon themselves to do them in the routine care of their patients. This is probably something that won't happen until the grant funded portions are no longer available, so we won't know how this looks for another year or two. And it goes without saying that COVID has thrown a major wrench into this project. We immediately stopped doing in-person assessments as soon as the pandemic started, uh, but we are just about ready to resume, but only the portions that can be completed over the phone. So I'll end there. And I thank you for all your time and attention for, and for having, um, having me here today. This is a picture from last year's conference. And in the middle are four members of my team um, that, as I said, was, this was the first time we were able to attend. And this was right around the time that we were finalizing and refining our own model. So thank you again. No, it's great. Thank you for the opportunity to hear about another program that's been working. And I think we all look forward to some discussion about um, the ways that we've learned from COVID and some things that we can try to, to incorporate from COVID into our um, geriatric assessments as we move along and hopefully see the end of COVID. Um, our last uh, scheduled speaker for the session is Dr. Siegler. Dr. Siegler is a, a professor of geriatric medicine and clinical medicine at Weill Cornell Medicine. Um, she is an associate program director for the medicine residency program and is a teaching attending on the inpatient geriatric service where she, and she also sees geriatric outpatients. Um, most pertinent to this talk, she's a geriatric consultant to the Weill Cornell HIV practice in the Center for Special Studies. Um, she has spoken about her program and her experience in starting the program at Weill Cornell um, previously at this meeting. And today she's gonna talk a bit more about government partnerships and how we can work with some funders to help start and support these programs. Dr. Siegler. Good afternoon. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to talk today. Here are my disclosures. 
The original plan was for uh, me to talk about our program here in New York City at, at Center for Special Studies where uh, uh, geriatricians are embedded in the HIV practice. But um, uh, everything sort of fell apart this winter and, and um, we still have not come back to normal, nor, nor are we sure what normal is going to be. And I wanted to take the opportunity um, to talk about uh, other things that have been happening both before coronavirus came and, and also even as we are reconfiguring our practices. Um, and that is, and that is uh, government partnerships in, in improving care with HIV. There are some silver linings to the COVID epidemic. Um, uh, uh, some of them have involved the use of telemedicine. Some have involved uh, uh, the recognition of, of social isolation uh, among consumers. Um, uh, but, but as well, it, it, it is this opportunity to think about how we're practicing and how we're caring for our patients. And it, are there opportunities as practices are disrupted to, to change the way we do things? I, I want to begin by, by uh, looking uh, more carefully at, at New York State. Uh, this is a map uh, that, that depicts the uh, prevalence of people living with HIV 55 and older in the United States. Um, New York State uh, is the darkest state here, that is it has the highest prevalence and, and nearly 1% of people 55 and older in New York State have HIV. If we look uh, more closely at the map of New York State, this is county by county, this, and, and this represents uh, uh, all people with HIV. Um, uh, HIV is common throughout the state, uh, not just in New York City, but in small, smaller cities like Syracuse uh, and in rural regions. The table describes the, the uh, percentage of people with HIV who are either 50 plus or 60 plus in New York State. This is New York State total. This is non-New York City. So uh, the 50 plus population is well over 50% throughout the state. Uh, more to the point, um, those people who live outside of New York City are slightly older. So people are aging with HIV throughout the state in counties that are rural, urban, uh, uh, of every type. And, and one of uh, our challenges is to, is to help all of them. Now, most of us are up here um, and we collaborate to lesser or greater degrees with uh, um, local, regional, and, and uh, federal entities, and I've, I've described these silos here for New York, for, for New, York. Um, New York City uh, uh, um, Disease Control is this Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Uh, the, at the federal level, um, I want to concentrate on, on the uh, programs that, that fund care, in particular HRSA. Um, HRSA's Ryan White program provides care for uh, more than half a million uh, people with HIV and roughly half the people in this country who have HIV. Many are familiar with the age at, uh, education training centers, but I also want to mention the geriatric workforce enhancement programs that HRSA also funds. So we have this interesting opportunity where HRSA funds both, both HIV care, as well as geriatric training. And, and, and one of the uh, challenges is to figure out how to, to uh, combine those things that HRSA is supporting. In New York State, the AIDS Institute uh, has, has a, a, a number of committees and programs, and, and they've offered me opportunities to, to uh, uh, learn and, and work with others. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what was happening before and after COVID-19 struck. Um, in early 2019, um, I, I joined the Medical Care Criterion Committee and, and uh, had an opportunity to present to consumers um, in September. One of the consumers at that meeting, uh, John Wakara, um, said, come on up to Syracuse. And, and 
we hurriedly put together a, a workshop for local providers and consumers in Syracuse that the AIDS Institute supported. Um, a few months later, I was, I spoke in Albany and also met with, with um, providers, local providers to try to help them brainstorm about how they can improve care with HIV. Um, we have since established a joint subcommittee with consumers and providers on um, HIV and aging and long-term survivors. Um, and, and I want to emphasize that a lot of this, a lot of this programming is consumer directed and consumer driven um, and is a collaboration between uh, uh, providers like myself and consumers um, and, and um, is statewide. And the AIDS Institute has been funding uh, uh, Zoom programming for um, uh, uh, support groups, but also has been funding personnel and town halls and surveys uh, that, that the subcommittee is directing. Many of you have participated in uh, the, the, the recent Ryan White meeting and are familiar with, with Ryan White uh, aging initiatives. Some of the earlier ones uh, are the, the National HIV Curriculum and their uh, HIV and aging newsletter. But uh, more recently, they have uh, uh, had a number of webinars. And, and what is in progress, and I think is, is especially exciting, uh, is what I mentioned earlier, which is the, the partnership between the Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Programs and the Ryan White Programs. In addition, they've, they've been, uh, they're producing some reference guides on screening and assessment and on leveraging uh, uh, the, the resources that one has locally. New York City is, is taking a slightly different tack um, uh, in that not only are they doing trainings and uh, preparing resource guides, but on the basis of, of recommendations, they have an RFP out to um, uh, uh, pr build a program that um, their, R their RFP says directly is, should be modeled on Golden Compass. They, have, they are very interested in having a large scale program uh, to enhance the care of people aging with HIV in New York City. And their focus is on achieving equity. So they are, they are looking both in terms of, of um, uh, local training as well as developing programs that have been uh, described and, and modeled here today. So um, it, it has been a, a, a very, um, unusual year for me in, in that I've seen much, much more interest in aging with HIV and, and trying to improve care of people aging with HIV at all levels. And, and I don't think this is just a tide coming in. I, I really think this is a sea change and, and I would love to hear from others in the group about what they are seeing locally and, and uh, uh, regionally in terms of, of support for these programs. I, I truly think that the quantity and support of, of um, educational content and technical assistance has changed. I do think that there is a sincere commitment to improving care and the funding uh, it is, is uh, a bit more plentiful than it has been even in the setting of, of um, of COVID-19. The, the roadblocks that I've seen is, is, include the difficulties in meeting the needs of clinical sites of all sizes and all regions. Um, uh, there is as well, uh, at least as, as um, consumers have told me, somewhat of a competition with the ending the epidemic mes message some of the funding for these programs and, and webinars are through ending the epidemic uh, um, uh, programs. And, and I think sometimes consumers feel that the, their aging issues are lost in that message. And I think we have to make sure that, that um, their needs are being heard and met. There are also still too many silos. We have had many town halls. We have had many webinars. How do we get the best value from them? What is the, the added value of an additional town hall that, that we can get based on, on uh, 
other information that's been gained from, from other meetings? And how do we facilitate linkages? If we, we sort of think uh, business-wise in terms of the organizational behavioral world, um, we're here. Um, those academic programs that have uh, received grants either through foundations or uh, um, through, through uh, government programs uh, are, are transformative. Um, we have the money to, to hire new people, to create new programs. Um, uh, and, and serve as models. And I think that's what uh, has been so exciting about what we've heard today. But most local programs are here. Uh, they're incremental. And, and I think that one of the lessons I've learned over the past year is how they're going to reconfigure their, their programs with such limited resources, how they're going to meet the needs of their older patients when when they are strapped to begin with. And I think some of our biggest challenges are taking what we're learning now and figuring out how local programs with far fewer resources are going to take what we've learned and, and use them. So the uh, um, bottom line message is, is that there, there's a great deal more uh, educational opportunities. There, uh, I think, are, uh, is a great deal more support for uh, communities to improve care with people with H uh, for people with HIV. And I've, I've put on this slide some of the uh, local, regional, and, and uh, HRSA-sponsored resources. Um, and, and I hope that in future meetings we'll have opportunities to think uh, together about about how we take what we're doing uh, and we're learning and, and help local programs. Thank you to all the speakers for a really fantastic overview of your programs and what's working. And I think we have about um, close to 30 minutes for our panel discussion. There's been an active chat so far and I encourage you to continue to submit your questions over the next um, several minutes. I wanted to start just with a point to follow up on Dr. Siegler's um, point about the, the, where some clinics are um, quite strapped in terms of their resources and others are in that transformative box. And I'd like to ask um, all of the folks on the panel, if you are encountering someone who really just wants to um, start to get something started and has minimal resources, what are a couple of things they could recommend to them are an easy way to get started or kind of the key elements to geriatric care that you might start to incorporate into a clinic? or even if there's something that, you know, just going and getting additional training. What, are, what would you recommend to someone who is particularly interested in incorporating more geriatric care into their clinic but has limited resources? I'm happy to start by just sharing the experience. I, I mean, first of all, I was really intrigued about the fact that uh, we are doing similar things without having to to each other, which sounds, obvious if it was a normal medical specialty like you know infectious disease TB treatment or HIV infection but the fact that we actually build these clinics from exactly what you're saying what did you need to start and I'm sure that if we actually really talk about the route and how we start that is quite different and if, but but with knowledge and sharing data and learning for people from people who attend the clinic we got to some to a product that is really similar and and i'm really excited about it actually i learned so much um just for you to know for us for example in london it took us 10 years to engage the geriatrician which to me is not a very good thing because I can see how the other clinics with the geriatrician on board started maybe later, but achieved a lot faster. So finally, uh, two years ago, we had a new consultant geriatrician for us, attending geriatrician who expressed an interest because thought, oh, this is a very interesting medical feel the aging with HIV. But when I started in 2009, uh, a lot of HIV colleagues didn't, weren't interested and thought it was a waste of time. 
and the geriatricians absolutely didn't engage. And then I tried again a few years later, and then I tried again a few years later. They were too busy doing other things. And I, I don't think, it, I think it's just a lack of knowledge rather than, rather than interest. So, you know, and, that, and it took us a long time. We just uh, did it from, from an HIV knowledge point of view. And again, reviewing the literature, the data, and trying to up, be updated all the time. And then maybe being in London and Chelsea, which is an area where there are a high number of people aging with HIV, higher than maybe other areas in the, in the UK or even in London, we had no choice. Victor Schmelzi, any comments on, on things you'd recommend to a colleague to minimal things that they could do to get started if they don't have those resources? Yeah, um, I, I, that's what I was going to say. I, I feel like we're very heavily resourced in terms of having grant funding, having, having free labor through grad students, um, having a lot of staff, having a lot of time to plan this. So in thinking about, um, you know, what led us to be successful and what might apply to different different groups that are not in that transformative phase to roll out a whole program. Um, I think one super important thing is just getting input and buy-in from anyone involved. So that's the patients, that's the staff, that's the providers. I think that was key for us. And so I think that can be done on a small scale. Maybe that's a quick survey. What do you think are the geriatric issues we address? And, and I think starting small is, is much simpler than what we did to you know, spend a year building a project. So maybe you, know, you do a depression screen and you do a MOCA on patients and you start there or you kind of you know, maybe educate your providers on the 10 different assessments that are available and they pick the one or two that might be applicable to a patient when they have time. So I think there is a way to start small um, and, and get some of the same benefits. Um, one, some two other thoughts. One is, is the um, uh, Medicare annual visit um, is, is, a, is often a great screen that, that can even be done uh, before people come to the office that covers uh, most of the domains. The other is, is something that I heard about last year um, in, in, in this meeting, which is the World Health Organization um, ICOPE, Integrated Care for Older People Guidance. Um, that um, is, is a terrific guidance that, that talks about uh, simple screens that can be done for various domains um, and also gives a, um, a, a a, a pathway for reacting to responding to positive screens. So one can look at it as, as an entirely integrated um, set of, of domains, or one can choose a particular uh, uh, item, for example, locomotion or hearing impairment, or any of the any of the domains, and have um, both the simplest screens to um, uh, referrals and and uh, other things to do when someone screens in the positive. Dr. Green, did you want to add anything? I mean, I just would echo what has been said. I think finding the champions in your clinic and like the stakeholder engagement, I think is really important. Um, what are people interested in? What are the um, older adults in your clinic, what are they identifying as the challenges? And I think a lot of things are probably being done. And so starting there, whether it's you're already doing depression screening to some degree, um, it's really easy to ask, have you fallen in the last year or the last six months? That takes 10 seconds. Um, and then you could start to have a workflow, even if it's initially just knowing like what physical therapist, for example, you could refer patients to. So I think there are ways of starting with just one or two small things and figuring out based, I, it's really, a lot of this is going to be dependent on your local resources um, and how you adapt. I think along the same line, I mean, here we're talking about starting things simply. Some of your programs have become very comprehensive. And one of the questions was when you have all these referrals and all of these things that get identified with your patients and you're sending them for um, to a neurologist and to a cardiologist and to a menopause clinic and all these referrals, do the patients actually go to these referrals? Are they getting overwhelmed by the number of referrals? And how do you help them help navigate what's the ideal number of referrals? I know one of the abstracts earlier talked about how fatigued patients were getting in these comprehensive visits. So how do you address that? I think 
probably to Dr. Bufito first, since I think it came up during her session, if she has any specific comments on that. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Can you repeat it? Because you were cut a bit. So I'm Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, how, do you, how do your patients handle the number of referrals? Sorry, if you're yes. sending them for 10 referrals, do they actually go to them all? Or is that yeah. overwhelming? So that is a very good point. So, um, because I, I, you know, I, I talk, I talked about all of these sounds like wonderful clinics. So we are trying to to do everything at the same time, and where so for example, the metabolic and live well pathway, it's a one stop clinic with the, with the doctor, the physiotherapist, and the dietitian. We have a clinic with everybody. So uh, the multidisciplinary team are meeting and are working on the clinic together. So the visits are as limited as possible. What we were able to do at the beginning and then we weren't able to do anymore were the, uh, the tests. So they have to come to the clinic and then radiology didn't work with us. Uh, to make sure that the bone mineral density scan and the coronary artery calcification uh, scan happen at the same time. At the beginning, they did, and then resources changed, and it changed. So sometimes people are not very happy about it, and uh, they decide uh, not to do it, but they feel that this is a good MOT, like a good whole health check that they have, at one point, so we hadn't had a lot of people not happy about it, and uh, they uh, understand that it's for their well-being, and and actually it's not very well. We had few people not being happy about it, but I I see what you mean. Sometimes the cardiology clinic is virtual, so we see them. We have and we request the test. We discussed the patient with the cardiologist with the results and we request the extra test. So we try to limit as much as possible. And we started to wor work virtually a little bit because of this, you know, with phone consultation to let them know about the appointment of, of the test and the virtual clinic because the cardiologists wouldn't see them unless really necessary to again limit the, uh, the number of visits. And then obviously with COVID, this has now escalated to be the, the majority of, uh, of the visits and the management. In a, a similar way, I think some um, one of the recommendations is often to stop medications in regards to polypharmacy. Um, and there's a question about how well um, patients accept elimination of prescribed drugs, if it's difficult to get those medications off. Um, and in the same line, we oftentimes recommend things like diet and exercise, as we talked a lot about yesterday, and how well are the, is that advice incorporated? So um, Dr. Green, I know you've had a lot of experience with trying to um, address the polypharmacy issue. Do you want to comment on that one? Sure. Um, yeah, so on Wednesday, you heard um, from Vivian Chen, one of our pharmacy students who um, worked with our pharmacist, Janet Gertrowski, who's here at this conference, um, to look back at what changes um, had actually happened at, after our visit and six months later. Um, and we did find that we were able to reduce potentially inappropriate medications like benzodiazepines. And that was in part how the clinic was structured. So when a patient came to geriatrics clinic, the first person they met with was Janet who went through all their medications and would start flagging, you know, she has a template, I think similar to maybe what is being used in Baltimore um, and would identify, okay, these are anticholinergic meds or these are other concerning meds and would start the conversation about, um, you know, this, there are some potential long-term side effects. She would often let me know as we would then meet before I would see the patient, um, this person is, you know, really attached to their benzos, but I have already told them that you're going to talk about it. I, I really think it's like a lot of other things. It's um, depending on the medication, it's like a harm reduction approach. So maybe you're not going to stop something completely, but maybe you reduce it or you at least provide the information because I don't think 
Um, I don't think a lot of older adults are necessarily aware of long-term harms or how just as we've heard at this conference, the changes that happen with aging related to pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics and that there could be real harms even though you've been safely taking a medication for like 20 years. Um, and so, I, and I think the other point is, is that they're potentially inappropriate. Potential is the key because there are some times where medications are truly indicated, um, but it's really weighing the risks and benefits. Um, another uh, important point, I think, um, or question was brought up in addition to one stop models. Um, Dr. Barberth says that it's important or essential to offer coordination of care for these complex uh, patients, um, particularly those that have multiple tests, visits, and referrals. So is this a, something that the HIV provider can take on, or how do we help to not only have a one-stop shop with the geriatrician in the HIV clinic, but how do we help to then coordinate all these referrals and walk the patient through um, following up with the neurologist and the cardiologist and all these other clinics? So have any of you implemented patient navigators or other systems to help with um, walking patients through these complex referrals and, and care? For us in the STRONG program, we do have a referral coordinator that we've always had, um, and that's kind of her only job is to handle all the referrals. Still, I think we all probably have the experience of people not making those referrals because there's other priorities in people's lives. They might not have transportation. They may not. They may be somewhat cognitively impaired and not remember to go to the appointment. So often I feel that um, as people are missing referrals, that ends up falling back to a nurse or social worker, um, you know, to say, hey, this person has missed this cardio cardiology visit twice. Can you try to reach out and figure out how we can help them get there? So I think in our clinic, at least it becomes kind of a team sport for those that, that are, have kind of proven that they're failing to, to do the referrals. And I think this gets to that um, point I raised about the role of the consultant. And I think this is this is like the ongoing challenge is that you can identify a lot of things, but there really has to be the follow-up. And I think, you know, sometimes my role as a consultant is to support the primary care providers who are very busy and already have a lot of things and would actually maybe like to do some of these additional things, but don't have the time in their visits. Um, and so we're constantly reevaluating, you know, what is the role of our, you know, team, our Golden Compass team um, in supporting clinic and how much goes back to the panel, um, the primary care provider and the nurse and social worker that work with that provider. Um, I think the other thing that we have been trying to do more and more is identify other organizations that provide case management that work with our clinic. Um, a lot of HIV case management services have been focused on people who have un, um, detectable viral loads. And we've been trying to push for there needs to be more case management services for older adults to address all the comorbidities and other things that we're seeing. And um, recently, we um, there have been um, one of our community partners, San Francisco AIDS Foundation, has started a specific case management program for people 50 and older. And so we've been working very closely in what that would look like and how we can help people coordinate appointments and referrals. So in London, we, in theory, the over 50 clinic is a one stop where you go see the doctor, spend time, discuss everything, book the test, and then review the results. And the results can even communicate it by email on the phone. But this is exactly when it actually become, doesn't become a one stop. And they can be followed by the over 50 clinic uh, with the support of trainees and pharmacists and specialist nurses and come to see us until all of that is resolved. So, you know, it's almost like a Gaussian curve. You have the person that actually comes to the over 50 clinic regularly at visits over two years or even more, or you have the person that comes once, we do the extra test, polypharmacy is not an issue, go, your health check is done, you know, and a lot obviously in the middle. So this is how we're managing. But what I was saying at the very end of my talk is that I think that we need to change this. Uh, maybe COVID gave us a push because I actually want to do this uh, single stop 
clinic. Uh, I want all our doctors to be able to do it. Now, I don't want to go too much into details, but we see 12,000 patients over seven clinics around Greater London under Chelsea Westminster. And this has increased over the past 11 years. So when I started, starting small without the geriatrician, now it's completely different. So I would like now our model to change. And I think with telemedicine will we'll actually help. And I want everybody to do the first stop. And then it's only if there is a referral that is needed. They will still be able to follow that up. But with the amount, with the increasing number of people who are aging with HIV, with increased percentage, I was really uh, sh shocked about the numbers in, in New York State, actually. We are, we are not there yet, but we're following. Uh, I think we need to change our model a little bit. There's no capacity anymore for, a, for a one clinic or a small group to, to manage that. I, I, and I, it sounds like San Francisco is, is very similar to to the next step already because of the high number of people that you see. And a couple of questions, I'm gonna merge a couple of questions that I think have some similar concepts. Um, one is that a lot of older individuals with HIV live in smaller communities or rural communities and don't have access to a larger medical system. Um, and it, obviously it can be really difficult for those types of clinics to start such a care um, model. Is it possible to try to implement and some of these aspects of care through um, existing consumer networks or um, other ways that we can try to implement that. Um, I, we've talked about telehealth a bit, or there are other ways that we can implement that. And then on the same, um, the same vein, Jules mentioned, um, how can we incentivize either larger hospitals or smaller hospitals to start some of these care models? I can take a couple things. I, I, I know this, we've talked about this. Um, I know Dr. Siegler has shared thoughts before. Um, I, I do think telehealth, the fact that Medicare CMS has liberalized telehealth, finally that I can do telehealth in an urban area because um, previously Medicare would not cover me, could not cover telehealth visits. But in rural areas, it's always been covered. And I think there are opportunities to maybe have I don't know, regional networks. I mean, there, there are examples of this that actually HRSA has done and HRSA has done with HIV and hepatitis C care. Um, the VA has done for HIV and hepatitis C care where you have a specialist and you can do telehealth visits um, with that specialist from the, within the local clinic if someone doesn't have the internet capabilities to do a video visit, for example. So I think there are ways um, of doing that project echo is the name of one of the HRSA projects. Um, where there's also like an educational component for providers often. Um, and I'm forgetting the second part of the question. Um, I think some of it was, are there ways to incentivize mm. hospitals to actually start these programs or do you need really a champion that wants to start the program within the system? I, I increasingly feel like Older adults need to start flooding the phones of healthcare administrators and say they want these things um, because that's really what will get the attention. Um, because I think uh, older adults are often overlooked, even within the healthcare system, at least in the US. And I feel like when, and a lot of times, some of that is because they cannot advocate for themselves. And so I think. I constantly am thinking we need to channel the activism that comes from long-term survivors and older adults living with HIV. And I think we could really channel that to really push for increased aging services. Um, a couple of comments just to, to add to what Meredith said. Um, the, the first is every, every clinical place has resources um, they, and they have to, to find them and, and leverage what they have. So uh, as an example, again, um, one program I talked to uh, had a, um, a, a physical therapy um, uh, um, bachelor's program in a, in a college nearby. And so they began to figure out how they could get those students into the clinic to have, to have better assessments. So some of this, again, is, is getting the clinical program excited about about 
doing something, about getting started, and then to look around and see what's available and, and how they can, can leverage what they have. The second is, is um, uh, certified peers, other, um, uh, other, other consumers who um, uh, can be um, pulled in not only to lobby and not only to, to promote this, but also to, um, I think, be, be useful in the clinic either to help with navigation or perhaps even to, to, um, to do some education. There, there, there are a lot of opportunities for consumers to, to boost this. Um, and um, in terms of um, how, um, how we incentivize, well, I, I think some of that is is again uh, up to the state and local governments to build those incentives in. Uh, one of the things that we've been talking about is, is with COVID, um, the, the budgets have been destroyed. And, and, and um, my argument has been, this is not the time to shut up about this. That it, if we don't keep uh, uh, insisting that um, HIV care uh, take the, the needs of older people into account, uh, some other noisier person is going to take over whatever budget we have. And, and so um, uh, this, is, this is the time to keep talking about it and to recruit and to, and to recognize, uh, Meredith, as, as you said, that, that um, uh, our, our consumers uh, need to um, help us keep the on the forefront in, in, with state governments and, and local governments that are that are looking for places to cut the budget. I think from a priority standpoint too, um, one of the comments was on the ending the epidemic and how can we uh, expand the ending the epidemic pillars to strengthen living longer and healthier with HIV um, to decrease that competition with trying to just in the epidemic and prevent new cases. And so do you have suggestions on ways, um, in, in addition to activism, because we're getting lots of comments um, on the chat right now about, about uh, increasing activism, but um, other suggestions to ensure that older adults no longer feel forgotten and the ways that we can expand that, um, ending the epidemic to um, uh, strengthening care and improving that fourth, sometimes we call it the, also the um, fourth component of adherence and um, ensuring that patients are in good care too with their that fourth component. So other suggestions from the speakers to address that point? Or we can just let it, it was a good comment too. So I don't know that it, um, if there's, I think it kind of just expanded upon some of the other points that we've made. So we did have a couple of specific questions. So one was um, um, a question about the MOCA and whether the MOCA is a good assessment for initial screening or if there's options for formal neuropsychologic evaluations beyond the MOCA at any of your institutions, if you use those types of assessments. Um, any opinions on neuro at your um, sites or within your studies? For us, a, a gerontologist was part of, our, um, part of our study and helped us decide what to use. Uh, and I don't honestly remember all of the conversations, but the MOCA is kind of what we landed on. And um, to answer the question more directly, we do not have neuropsych testing readily available for our patients. So we kind of do the MOCA and then, um, and then go from there. And, and I think that's part of our problem is we don't know exactly where to go from there other than specific local programs that are, are you know, set up intent, you know, for that exact purpose to help people with the cognitive dysfunction. Uh, this is like an ongoing challenge. Um for like abbreviated cognitive screenings that can be done in an outpatient clinic. And I think if you look at the short ones like MOCA, MMSE, SLOMS, you know, all these things. Um, I mean, there's the mini COG, which is the shortest. Maybe I, it hasn't, I don't think been formally studied in HIV, um, does get at some executive function with the clock, which is um, a big component of hand. The MOCA is definitely more sensitive than the MMSE. I mean, there's also the HIV dementia scale and, and some of those tests, but are more, much more sensitive for full HIV associated dementia and not 
um, the milder forms of hand that are more common. Um, I, a neuropsych testing is not an extensive resource. Um, I mean, we have resources in San Francisco, but especially now because they weren't doing any at all for several months, uh, it's at least a six month wait. And so I actually feel like that's often the default. And I think there are other things that could be done way in advance of that. Um, and then a similar question is how often are you implementing the coronary artery calcium scores? Is that something that you're doing routinely? Um, have you found it useful? Do you do it for everyone? A couple questions on that. We offer it, we offer it one offer to everyone above the age of 50. And then we manage it. And then we review it with the cardiologist and she tells us whether we need to repeat it and when. But in theory, you uh, improve their health, you improve their cardiovascular disease, you improve their uh, he yeah, health in general. So hopefully not a lot of them have to repeat it because if it requires an intervention, the intervention happens. So our at the end of our session, I think um, there's still some questions in the chat. But we tried, I think we addressed at least an aspect of a lot of them. Um, Jules has welcomed the, all, all the participants to join him in what we call the lobby discussions following this, which is a informal Zoom chat for anyone who um, would like to continue the conversation. Um, we will also have a poster um, presentation for some of the posters that are unable to load yesterday. We will open up the poster sessions for the rest of the afternoon, I think, for another two to three hours. So um, if there's posters that you were unable to view yesterday, they should all be up and working today. So um, I'd like to, to really thank all of the speakers for this session for sharing their experiences with their clinics. Um, it's really a great opportunity to hear about all the things that you're doing. Um, thank you for being honest and talking about things that are working or not working. And I think it was a really great discussion. I think obviously something we'd like to continue and hopefully can have some more sessions somewhat similar to this next year. Um, it's nice to hear that it's not something simple to start. And I know um, many of you have been working on this for 10 or 15 years. And so it's not something we can necessarily um, turn out overnight, but it's, it's just great to hear things that have worked well so that we can uh, continue to um, improve programs and hopefully make this a more routine clinic that's offered in many uh, different settings. So to provide a bit of a wrap up of the meeting, um, I'd like to thank all of our attendees for coming to the meeting. Um, I know it's a, a little bit different when you don't get the opportunity to travel to New York City and um, I missed a play that I was hoping to see on Broadway. Um, instead just got to watch some Netflix on TV at home, which isn't nearly as exciting. So it, it certainly um, was a different environment this year, but I think we did have a, a unique opportunity to interact via the chat, which was um, a lot of fun and got to meet people. I think it was a lot easier for some of our international colleagues to attend without the time change differences in the cost of travel. So I'm glad that all of you were still, still able to attend and experience the meeting and hopefully um, learned a lot. Um, we did have some initial technical difficulties, which was resolved pretty quickly. Um, we heard a, a great kind of overview of um, Dr. Courier's career to start the session, talked about antiretroviral issues and aging and unique considerations for prescribing drugs and taking drugs and, uh, or taking antiretroviral therapy in older adults. Um, the second day of the meeting focused a lot on issues of fat and bone, and I think the take home was to exercise and eat well and exercise some more and continue to eat well. Um, improve the bones and, and decrease fat. And then today we talked a lot about um, uh, neurocognitive disorders um, and the, the really unique role the oral microbiome might play with periodontal disease and neurocognitive disease, uh, some time on macular degeneration and various eye diseases and the association with um, HIV and aging, and then a great discussion on some of the clinical implications and management, um, as well as the pathogenesis of peripheral neuropathy is something that we oftentimes don't hear a lot about, but it, uh, certainly see a lot in our clinics. Um, and then uh, as you were all just experienced, we talked a little bit about care models and some of the ways that we can incorporate all these complexities of care um, in the HIV clinic or in the geriatric clinic. Um, is really excellent abstracts pres abstract presentations throughout. We were a little hesitant to decrease the time on all of the talks, but hopefully we kept people engaged and still had a chance to share your research and 
Um, also thank the poster present presenters for their, um, uh, especially those that did the rapid poster presentations for the very brief presentations, but at least gave us an intro to your posters. Um, and hopefully the, those in the poster sessions had some visitors or will this afternoon as we figure out how to do the virtual uh, poster visits. Um, so again, I'd like to thank our presenters and our attendees, our sponsors, um, Jules for leading the post-conference discussions. Uh, please fill out evaluations. If you have thoughts or suggestions on topics for next year, we would love to hear about them. Uh, we clearly don't know quite yet if we'll have a virtual meeting or an in-person meeting next year, but we hope to see you all um, one way or the other at next year's meeting. Um, and again, just thank you for attending and we look forward to your feedback and hopefully seeing you again next year. So thank you.